Okay, it's time to build a retaining wall. What you're gonna see behind me is a wall that we built a few years ago for a customer in a site in Minneapolis. We use the Versalock standard units on this course. The customer did their own secondary retaining wall. Um, they used a different block. I wouldn't recommend doing that, but uh, they did this after the fact and out of our control. And when you look at this garage, you can see where we actually had to dig back the soil to sneak a wall in behind this garage to keep the pressure off from the garage from the yard. Today, I'm gonna to teach you how to bid doing a job like that because the customer right next door wants the exact same thing done. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna break this proposal down into removals, excavation, and then retaining wall installation. And a couple of the details that we need to take into consideration is the joint space from one wall to the next. Now we're gonna be using the same block in this very specific case, but we're gonna to have to stitch this wall together. And you've seen my, maybe you've seen my other video where I talk about retaining wall installation. But on this project, what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna go from the base, and then we're gonna remove this wall up at an angle so that this is removed and then when we build this new wall, we join them together and eliminate this seam. So how do we go, go ahead and start calculating this thing down? Well, the first thing we're gonna look at is the removals. Now in this case, there is no magic mystery formula that's gonna solve this problem for you. So you have to look at this and you're gonna use a time and material basis. It's gonna be a lump sum. You're gonna to have to be careful. You're going to have to base it off from experience. On this very particular project, our removal cost is going to run about $2,000 to remove this retaining wall, to remove these steps, and to get this dug back far enough that we can get our drainage material and our um, base course in. Then we're going to also measure the retaining wall, and I'm going to take you through the measuring process right now because we're gonna break the wall down into its simplest components and that's on a per square foot basis. And I'm gonna cover with you back in the office when we put all these numbers together, why we wanna know exactly how many square feet we've got in this wall and how we're gonna format our proposals to take that into consideration. Another component of this project is excavation. I want you to look at this. This, this garage wall right here is actually acting as a retaining wall and it might be a little difficult to see from the video but this garage wall is in a state of failure you've already have a crack here that they've tried to repair with plaster which is nothing more than an aesthetic fix at that point structurally that that patch does absolutely nothing the only way to save this re this garage wall is to take the pressure off. To take the pressure off, I have to go up and dig the soil off from the garage wall. So all of this dirt that you see here, it has to be excavated off. And then I have to build the retaining wall about three, four feet off from this garage wall and then tie it in on the end. Okay? To dig this out, is a separate component that's the excavation number and it's not a very big excavation job but it's not an easy one it's a matter of getting a mini excavator up here so we'll, what we'll be doing is we'll be removing that retaining wall and not building a new wall but building a ramp up into this backyard and then we come through the backyard and we use a miniature excavator and we carefully pull the soil off you got to be real cautious how you do this because you got to realize every time you dig down, you're putting pressure on a failed garage wall. So you do little scoops and you scoop backwards. Instead of going back, what you do is you kind of gently scrape away to pull pressure off. And that's how you're going to solve that problem. Get this off and give you enough space to come in to build your retaining wall in this case. That's why we're going to itemize just this component of it because it's going to be expensive. And the customer needs to understand where that money is coming from, where their money is actually going to. And so when you itemize it, you protect yourself, you clarify it for the customer, they have a better understanding 
and it's not that magic mystery lump sum number that I'm telling you guys to avoid. You build profits into every component of the job so you don't have to fear any one section of the job. Um, next is measuring. So let me get the measuring tools out and take you through the simple way that we measure these retaining walls and how we go about getting those numbers so we can put it into uh, the proposal back at the office. All right, so let's get into the measuring. I'm going to show you how easy it is. I'm just going to use just a standard tape measure. I have a 50 and 100 foot tape behind you that sometimes I use as well. But in this case, we're just going to use a standard tape measure. One of the things that I want to focus on in this, this example is to make sure that you understand you've got to bury a course. Now, this is a pretty flat grade in this case. This is just a parking lot. So we're going to bury one course. We're gonna go six inches deep. Now you can't, by any means, show that to the customer after the fact. So the customer needs to understand beforehand that your measurements includes all embedment. So I literally just measure the length of the retaining wall. It's 25, it's 25 feet from the end of the wall to the return on the step. And we know they're going to put new steps in. We're going to bust these steps out. We know they got to pour new steps, so we've got to measure the returns as well. But we've got 25 linear feet and the average wall height. Here's something I want, important that I want to show you. This wall actually is not perfectly the same height all the way through. It's taller here. It's shorter there. The easiest way to measure this retaining wall is dead center. That's going to give you an average from the tallest point to the shortest point for your quantity. Now remember, we're going to charge the customer on a price per square foot. We're going to use a spreadsheet, the same formula that we use with a paver patio. We're going to get a spreadsheet from the supplier. We're going to have every block accounted for, including the cuts, including all the blocks you got to throw away that you got to remove small portions that you can't go back after the job and measure, we're going to use the spreadsheet, okay? But beforehand, this is a proposal. This is our initial offer to the customer. We've got to get that quantity figured out. To do that, we're going to go dead center of this wall. We know it's 25 feet. Dead center is here. This wall is 4.5 feet tall of exposed wall. And I always add one foot. Now we know we're gonna add six inches for sure. One foot is always a better footing. You can always back a little bit out, but so it's gonna be 25 by 5.5. That's gonna give me my complete square footage for the face of this wall. Now we're gonna measure the returns next. And then we're gonna go in, I'm gonna show you how we're gonna measure the retaining wall that is immeasurable. What I mean is, there's no retaining wall there now. I can't get a tape up in there. I'm gonna show you how we do that. It's easy. So here we are looking at this return right here. And this is what I call the return. It's this, the wall that runs up alongside the steps. We measure the return the same way we measure the average height of the wall. We just go, what's the length of the return? In this case, it's six feet. We go the halfway point three foot, we measure the height of the wall at that point, which is two feet. We're going to add one foot for embedment. This return is going to be 18 square feet, so it's six times three, okay? We got one, two returns. So we know we've got 18 and 18. We got 36 square feet just in these returns. Don't forget to measure those. They're going to be a little bit more of a pain in the butt to install. So make sure your quantities are strong on these things because the worst thing you can do is put a lot of labor and time in it and then short yourself on materials as well. So if you want to protect yourself, make sure you get a good strong estimate on something like this. That's the way I do all my returns. Average return is usually between 15 and 20 square feet. I don't even measure them anymore, but for this video, I wanted to show you how we come up with those. I may actually technically put this proposal in at a little above 18 square feet because it is such a steep run, narrow opening, doesn't give my installers much room to work. Next, let's go in this failed garage wall and show you how we're gonna measure that. 
So we're inside this garage right now, and one of the things I want to point out to you is we are actually building the retaining wall on the outside of this structure. It's really not feasible to measure it out there. So what I'm going to simply do is I'm going to take my tape measure and I'm going to measure the length of this garage. And then I'm going to measure the estimated height of the retaining wall outside. Now this garage is your typical garage, which is about 22 feet long. But we gotta, we're going to compensate a little bit. We always want our, our um, estimated numbers to be just a titch higher. It's a safety factor for you and the customer. This one's 22 feet long. This garage wall is four feet, four and a half feet. Pretty much the same as what we have over there. We're going to go by five feet in this case. So that's how we're going to come up with the quantity for this to make sure that when we do the install, we know we've got the main wall measured, we've got the two returns measured, and then we've used this garage wall as our template for our retaining wall, which gets installed outside of it. And we have our excavation number that we're going to go back over and do the, do the calculations for that in the office. So this is how we start any retaining wall project is by field measurements. All right, it's time to go over some actual numbers on this project and teach you how to bid this retaining wall for your own. Uh, first off, before we get started, I want to apologize. I'm a little dusty. I'm a little dirty. If you watch my video, Day at Work with Genetic, um, you'll see in that video I had met with a customer and gave, gave him a proposal to regrade his yard for $2,000. Well, I started that job this morning at 8 o'clock, and it's now a little bit after 12, 12.30, and I got it all wrapped up. So I figure it's now time to phase two to get this uh, retaining wall bid so I can show you guys how to do this on your own. Now, I want you to pause the video right here. I want you to look at this job. This is the actual bid sheet from 2012. It's right now 2015. I originally bid this job May 4th, 2012. So look at the numbers that you see there on that sheet. And what you're going to find is the job has grown okay i haven't done anything to the job but the homeowners had a couple years to chew on it and they finally figured out what they really wanted to do and they came back and said hey we want to add on and you've seen what we did we were removing the dirt excavating behind the garage wall and so i'm going to go over i'm going to compare and com contrast the two numbers now they said something that was key in this proposal they said they understood the rate of inflation would probably have increased some of the components of the job besides the fact, now that's the key, besides the fact that they had added on to the job anyway. So I want you to look at 2015's proposal. I want you to take a moment to pause this video. This is the actual proposal that was turned in to them. And what you will see is, it is line item per line item per line item per line item. And we're going to go over that. And this is the way you're going to format your proposals. This is going to work for you. It's going to protect you. Okay. The first line item on this thing is the actual retaining wall itself. Now, in this case, we have approximately, that's the key term, approximately 298 square feet. That means that I'm, I'm, I think there's 298 square feet on the job, and that's what I'm going to put in for that price per square foot. Now, the original quote was $28 per square foot back in 2012. Because of inflation, we're now at $32 per square foot. And you are going to be asking me, well, how did you come up with that number? That's my market price, okay? For residential, you will be dictated by your market price and nothing more. Commercial is a different beast. These numbers will not apply towards a commercial site. You need to understand that. And I will give you a video on commercial sites. Literally, commercial sites, the smallest commercial site you'd ever want to even touch would probably be six, seven, eight hundred square feet, but you're going to get about half of the price per square foot. I'm getting $32 a square foot because the market says I can get that. My reputation says I can get that, which means people know me. They're calling me after three years, original proposal, modified proposal, uh, up-to-date proposal. And so that allows me to make sure that my prices are the same. And it, it tells me automatically that 
three years ago they were good with $28 a square foot. I'm not going to go backwards on it. So um, I want you to look at remove the wall. Now you've seen we had a wall to remove. And that was the first portion of the wall. I had divided the wall into two sections. Um, from the garage to behind the garage was one section and that was excavating. But everything in front of the garage was a different section. And in this proposal, I've actually line item the removal of that area at $1,760. Okay. And then right below that, I have actually line item the excavation to haul away the soil behind the, the garage wall. So we have to, what they want us to do is they want us to pull that soil off from the garage wall because it's caving in. They want us to haul that away and get rid of it and create that gap that you'd seen we showed it according on the next door neighbor's site, okay? And to do that portion of the work, I wanna be very specific how I did this. Now, excavate and haul away soil to create a four to six foot gap, okay? Haul out 46 tons or three loads of soil between the building and the retaining wall. Now I'm not creating a 10 foot gap and I'm not hauling out 80 tons of soil. I have very clearly said I'm gonna haul out 46 tons or three loads and I'm gonna create a four to six foot gap. Now how do I come up with a four to six foot gap? Well, the, it's a simple math. The length of that wall was about 22 uh, linear feet. The height of that bank is five foot and we're gonna create a five foot cut between the two. So it's 22 times five times five, then you divide that, that gives you cubic feet, then you divide that by 27 to convert to cubic yards, okay, and that's compacted cubic yards. Then you multiply by 1.25 to go from compacted cubic yards to expanded cubic yards because it automatically fluffs up. As soon as you dig it out, the dirt fluffs up and becomes bigger, okay, and then I don't haul in cubic yards, I haul in cubic tons. So then we're gonna multiply by another factor of 1.3536, or maybe even 1.5, somewhere in that neck of the woods, depends on the type of soil, to go from cubic yards, fluffed cubic yards, to metric tons, okay? Seems like a lot of math, boom. I'm gonna to try to put it in as I'm talking about it right over on the side of me here so that you have it, you have a greater understanding. The key component to that is I have clearly identified for $4,000 what work I'm going to do on this very specific line item, okay? I'm safe. If anything goes wrong, it's not on my back. It, that way I'm protected and I've outlined it before we start with the customer. So they have an understanding of what we're gonna be doing. Now, as part of that program, part of this job proposal, we have to actually disassemble part of the neighbor's wall. We have to stitch it back together. So the neighbor's wall comes flush. Here's the wall we're removing. Here's the neighbor's wall that we had built. I've got to peel this part back and then stitch it into the existing wall so they all flow together. That doesn't happen for nothing, okay? There's a lot of work that has to go into that, and I'm line iteming that. I'm line iteming that for $725 is what I'm line iteming that for. It's going to take me about a day to pull it apart and probably another day or so, half a day to reassemble it and put it all together. It's not a huge amount of work on its own, but it's just part of the overall scope of work and something that's easy to overlook. So I want to make sure that you guys are on the same page as me. Now, because in the original proposal, I had options in here, optional, removing stairs, reassembling fence, saving the fence, exporting extra fill soil, and the customer was okay with this format, I'm kind of sticking with that for the rest of this one, okay? And so I have the same thing, remove the stairs and dispose. Now this case is $490. In the original proposal from 2012, it was $390. So the extra $100, inflation. Everything costs me more now. It's been three years, so that's how I justify it. Hand disassemble fence and save it is a line item. It's $350. Behind that retaining wall was a fence. 
I really hope they don't want me to hand disassemble and save that thing because it's not going to look any better. And I'll probably end up talking the customer out of it. But in case they're adamant about it, I'm protected. I have $350 in there. And then here's an important one. Here's an important line item that the last line item is export extra fill soil at $325, okay? Make sure you go back and pause this video in the beginning and then make sure you get a good understanding. That last line item protects me. If our math is off, if the calculation of the soil that we're going to remove between the garage and the, um, the bank and the retaining wall that we're going to build doesn't quite work out, and I end up hauling one more extra load out, I'm protected. Here's what I'm going to get. I'm going to get $325 for that extra load of dirt. It says so right in the contract, right on the very bottom. Okay. Now, a lot of you are asking, well, how much is the overall job value here? Well, look at it. There it is. It's right there. That's what this project is. And in fact, I want you to notice a few things. Not only did I line item everything that's in this job, but then I go back and I repeat myself and say, hey, this proposal includes certain things. And then I go in and say, this proposal does not include. I actually go through and I exclude things. A lot of them don't even apply towards this job, but it's boilerplate. Boilerplate means it's on every single project that I do. I cover myself because it's too, too hard to try to think of every detail on every job. So you create a generic list and you rubber stamp it onto every job. You know what else is rubber stamped on my proposals on every one of them? Excuse me for bumping you. See this box right here? See this box? Boom, 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 boom. Look at, I even specifically outlined that box. Do you know what that box is? Notice of pre-lean. You have to do that in my state. I don't know about your state. But if I don't give them a pre-lean notice, if this gal and this guy decide they don't want to pay me, I can't lean their house. But because it's right on the original proposal and they will have to sign this, give me $100 and send it back to me. Here's how my proposals look, okay? Here's actually a few of our, our here's our job list. Here's how we, we format it, okay? Their $100 deposit gets stapled right to their check. And this is how busy we stay because of how we operate. There's no way I can get through a quarter of these jobs this year. I'm already booking for next year because every proposal is the same guys and gals out there. It's clear. It's easy for the customer to understand. I break it down line item per line item. It's tougher for me to do that. You know what I'd rather be doing right now than putting proposals together? I'd like to be in the shower because I'm itching from head to toe. But when you take the time to do it like this, you are going to be so busy that work is going to be nonstop. It's July or it's August 4th and we're booking into next spring because of the way we format it. And I want you guys to be as busy as that. I believe you guys can be as busy as that. I know you guys can be as busy as that. Um, reach out to me if you need help with estimating, if you need help with proposals, if you need help with a lot of things, I'm here to help you. Uh, I'll do the best I can for you. Um, with whatever information I have. So I hope this has helped you. I know it's been a ton. I know I'm speaking kind of fast and I apologize for that, but I get so amped up when I'm going over stuff like this. There's so much information to cover and doing a format like this is easy once you wrap your head around it, but it's difficult before you get into it. It's like a learning curve, man. Everything in this business, everything we do is this learning curve. You amp up, it's the unknown. It's difficult at first, but once you do it, Boom! Cruise control. You can just fly. You can rock it. You can get through these things. A lot of these never change on my proposals. A boilerplate, the pre-lean notice, proposal includes, proposal does not include. That all stays the same. Sometimes I modify details here or there. The important part of these proposals is my protection, is your protection. How do you keep yourself safe? Instead of having the lump sum magic mystery number that people can argue, fuss, and fight over that doesn't leave customers comfortable, it doesn't make them feel warm and fuzzy about hiring you because they don't know what they're getting, break this thing down and put profit into every component of your job for yourself and you're going to love it. You're going to be more successful. 
think I'm going to go hop in the shower. Have a good one, guys and gals.